Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. The patient who has a glioblastoma will often present with neurologic symptoms as one would expect. Uh, these can include headache, progressive neurologic deficit, and seizures. The progressive neurologic deficit, it's important to remember that uh, sometimes the patient will show up with something that appears sudden. For example, in the emergency room, a patient may come in with what seems like the sudden onset of symptoms, uh, paralysis, for example, on one side of the body. And when seen, it's important to get a good history from the patient to make it clear that this is in fact progression. So retrospectively, perhaps the patient was noticed to have some mild weakness a few weeks before, and then this has progressed to the point where something became so apparent as to prompt an appearance in an emergency setting. The patients uh, who come in with seizures, it's often a much more clear onset of symptoms. The patient may have in fact been normal up to the point where they had the seizure uh, and then comes in uh, with a sudden uh, occurrence of uh, shaking of the body, loss of consciousness, or something that appears clinically to be a seizure. That may be one way of presentation. And then uh, the headache is often uh, an early morning headache, uh, improving during the course of the day, and has varying qualities. It has to be recalled that it's very rare for a patient who has a headache to harbor something like a glioblastoma, but that's certainly in the differential diagnosis of somebody with a headache, is that they may have a space-occupying lesion, like a brain tumor, like a glioblastoma. But those are the major ways in which a patient with a glioblastoma might present. Once the patient is recognized to have one of these neurologic symptoms, then usually some sort of imaging occurs. A CAT scan, uh, is often performed, which may uh, reveal a mass. Uh, with contrast, CAT scan is much more sensitive than a non-contrast CAT scan, and uh, MRI scan is much more sensitive than CAT scan at picking up, especially smaller lesions. Usually on a CAT scan or an MRI, a glioblastoma will enhance, and this is believed to be due to a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier that allows the leakage of the contrast agent that's administered uh, as part of the scan. Once an MRI has revealed that there is a lesion, then uh, often some additional imaging is done to help to further characterize what's seen on an MRI. So MR spectroscopy, magnetic resonance spectroscopy is one technique. Um, positron emission uh, tomography can be useful, but really, Ultimately, it comes down to making a diagnosis using a uh, histologic examination of what's inside of the head. In order to do that, some sort of surgery needs to be done, and this can range from a needle biopsy to an open biopsy to a uh, open surgery with the goal of resecting, removing as much of the tumor as feasible. Many years ago, uh, because of a fatalistic attitude toward glioblastoma, a tumor that was suspected to be a glioblastoma on a scan was often interrogated only with a needle biopsy, and the limitations of the needle biopsy and sometimes sampling errors uh, could cause the tumor to be undergraded and not to be recognized as a glioblastoma, and therefore not permitting the patient to get adequate treatment. Uh, currently, Almost in all cases, an open biopsy is preferred unless the tumor is really unavailable uh, in terms of safety for open biopsy, the goal being to get adequate tissue to make a diagnosis and then send the tumor for special studies that are often used now in helping to make decisions down the line. For the surgery, uh, the tumor is taken out uh, and given to the pathologist and that is the way that the diagnosis is ultimately made. After surgery, the tissue goes off to the pathologist for histopathologic diagnosis. Typically, the pathologist is going to look at the tissue, find that necrosis, the endothelial proliferation, and say this is a glioblastoma.
However, there's one specific subtype that can look like that that has a better prognostic group and actually won't end up with the final diagnosis of glioblastoma. And that is a group called the anaplastic oligodendroglioma. The cells tend to have a little different appearance. They look somewhat like a fried egg under the microscope to the pathologist. And they do a molecular test for oligodendroglioma looking for 1P and 19Q deletions. If the specimen has those deletions and that fried egg cell type, it's called an anaplastic oligodendroglioma. And although it's treated in much the same ways as the glioblastoma, although there are some different chemotherapies that are offered for that, they have a much better prognosis. The other prognostic variables that tend to be looked at for glioblastoma include the methylation status um, of MGMT. If the MGMT is methylated, that tends to indicate that the patient will respond to temozolomide and puts them in a better prognostic group. But the most important prognostic factor of the last few years has been the IDH1 mutation, the isocyanate dehydrogenase. When IDH1 is mutated, it tends to be in younger patients. This is the old classification of the secondary glioblastoma, often arising from a lower grade glioma. And these patients tend to do much better than their counterparts who are IDH1 wild type. These patients with the IDH1 wild type tend to be older patients who have the de novo or new, newly arising glioblastoma and often also have epidermal growth factor receptor mutations with them. Now the epidermal growth factor receptor mutations you know, with some of the therapies that are coming out these days are starting to allow a bit of molecular classification as there are a couple of vaccines and a couple of therapies out there right now that specifically attack epidermal growth factor receptor mutations, especially one that has a truncated expression on the surfaces of the cell uh, called the EGFRV3 mutant, which occurs in about 60 or 70% of de novo glioblastomas.